Is it visible? Yes, it's visible. Oh, okay. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Vishnu, for the kind introduction, and thank you, uh, Team Harman India, for inviting me. Uh, and uh, I'll start. Uh, I'll, st I'll speak in next twenty minutes. Uh, it's very huge topic to describe in next twenty minutes. To, uh, though I will try to do justice uh, uh, to this topic. Uh, so, approach to ambiguous genitalia. Uh, ambiguous genitalia is a thing like which is not uncommon uh, in our endocrine clinics. Uh, so, coming to the terminology. Uh, Intersex was the term which was being used till 2006 for the uh, persons with a typical development of the chromosomal, gonadal, or anatomic sex. Uh, since 2006 onwards, when a landmark publication came uh, defining the DA, uh, defining the intersex, and they had used the term disorders of the sex development. So since then, this is the most prevalent term disorders of the sex development because this was more scientific, and uh, th that group reclassified this entity. Uh, and that classification was based on the underlying etiology. It was not random as it was earlier. So that was more useful. And uh, in now, like four or five years, I will say, differences of the sex development is more commonly used. Though still most common term is disorders of the sex development. But uh, in recent papers and textbooks, they have started using because it's less stigmatizing for the patients and patient support groups accept that more comfortably. So differences of the sex development will be the prevalent term in coming years, I think. And the uh, prevalence of this uh, uh, issue is that uh, it is around one is to four, four to five thousand overall. But this data is Western data. In India, we do not have any formal registry to say that. But possibly it, it will be higher than that because probably more uh, consanguinity will result in most of these diseases. So uh, we'll see in next slides. Uh, so DSD, uh, by when we call a child. He, like he, he is a child of uh, uh, disordered sex development. Then there is over genital ambiguity. Anytime when we are not able to define whether the child is a male or female at, at the time of birth, we will call it a DSD generally. But what are the objective criteria? When over genital, genital ambiguity is there in any form, like cloacal exostrophy, even we, we may uh, put in DSD. Apparent female genitalia with the signs of virilization, like enlarged clitoris or posterior label fusion, is there. Or in later uh, childhood, if there is an inguinal mass, then we can say it as DSD. Apparent male genitalia with signs of undervalidation, like uh, micropellus or hypospadias, or both of them uh, together, or associated with the undescended testes. That condition can be called DSD. A family history of DSD, like complete endogenous insensitivity syndrome, when child has, then we, we should look for that. Child should not have this condition, and he may be classified as DSD without any ambiguity even. And a discordance between the genital appearance and parental karyotype, if, if it was done, then that will be classified in the DSD. So these are the objective criteria we should use to classify a, a child as DSD. Uh, so what are the causes of DSD? Uh, dimorphic gonadal development is primarily decided by the sex chromosomes. And uh, with this, these sex chromosomes, several autosomal genes are also identified to play a part in this gonadal development. And after when gonads have been, uh, gonads have been developed in embryo, right hormone at the right time with functioning receptor will give rise to normal internal and external genitalia. And that will uh, result in a dimorphic sex, normal dimorphic sex. And any deviation from this issue, uh, from this uh, cascade, from sex chromosome to genes to right hormones will result in the DSD. So uh, coming briefly to these issues, which uh, we talked in last slide, gonadal development, gonadal development, uh, gonads are developed from the urogenital age, around uh, up to seven or eight week of embryo. Uh, it remains like a bipotential gonad, which may be converted to any of ovary or testes. So from a cascade of events, some genes are responsible, which will decide whether this gonad will turn into ovary or testes. So SRY SOX9 combination is the factor which will decide whether this gonad goes to the testis pathway. And RSPO, WNT, FOXL2 are the genes which are the main, uh, main uh, deci uh, deciding factors which will lead this pathway towards ovary side. And uh, it is not like that earlier we used to think we used to taught, we being taught that uh, if a child does not uh, become a male, he 
by default becomes a female but it is not like that it is now uh, now well being pro been uh, proved that these are really repressive pathways when sry and choxman get activated they will repress the rsp wmt pathway which is the main main deciding factor for the ovarian pathway and when foxl2 and rsp wmt pathway get activated it will suppress the sry choxman pathway so they are mutually exclusive pathways once uh, this goes into this pathway this will repress another pathway and a normal ovary develops and any issue in this pathway will result in the dhd at gonadal level so dhd at gonadal level how it uh, it may present either absence of gonadal development so real it will result in the complete gonadal dysgenesis it may be partial gonadal development that will result in the partial gonadal dysgenesis it may be it may be total reversal like uh, x axis testicular dhd when y component mainly sry and x sox9 are incorporated in the x chromosome it will result in the x axis testicular dhd or there may be components of the both the gonads normal component of the both the gonads in a single gonad then it will present as a overtestis coming to the external genitalia after gonads when uh, one gonad is formed it will start secreting hormones which 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 are which will be responsible for the further development of the dimorphic sex and it will result in, into the virilization in males and non virilization in the females along with amh hormone it will result in the normal external genitalia so three important terms i will utter genital tubercle uh, this this is genital tubercle of the bipotential external genitalia so when it is virilized it get good exposure of testosterone and dhd later on it will go to the like it will increase in size and it will become glans penis in a male child and second thing urethral fold with the fold this part pink part i will say when it gets it gets good androgenization it will become shaft of the penis with with the penile urethra and when it is not virilized there is no androgen then it will become the labia minora of a female child and labia scrotal swellings are these blue things uh, when this is virilized it will become scrotum of the future child and when not virilized when there is no fusion of the labia scrotal folds they will become the labia majora of a female child so this all these all events occurs between 8 to 14 weeks of age so before 8 weeks there is this is a single by potential external genitalia and after that within next 5 to 6 weeks it happens that virilization happens and either child will become a male external genitalia child or a female external genitalia child so this is this is called masculinization masculinization programming window and when gonadal development is disturbed before this event then that will lead to a genital ambiguity because of gonadal dysgenesis and if gonads Uh, like issue with the testis happens after this event after 14 weeks of uh, embryonal age then that will be called testicular menisci syndrome there will not be any testis but there will not be any ambiguity even so testosterone and the dihydrotestosterone are the testosterone are the main factors which will decide the anatomy of the external genitalia so this is uh, what they do testosterone is mainly responsible for the development of the internal genitalia and descent of the testis from the inguinal part to the scrotum what are the internal genitalia part in the male that is epididymis vas deferens ejaculatory duct and seminal vesicle by dhd is mainly responsible for fusion of the labia scrotal folds development of the penis and prostate so uh, this is how it happens when five alpha ductal deficiency is there dhd deficiency will mainly affect external genitalia in these parts and when androgen by synthetic defects is there then it will affect both the parts because if there is no androgen there will not be any dhd also so coming to the classification this is uh, this was given in 2006 but this is uh, like this is still prevalent this is the most scientific classification and is being used widely uh, as of now uh, we can divide in three parts uh, sex chromosome dhd 46 xy dhd and 46 xx dhd sex chromosome dhd when karyotype is not xx or xy it is different from that either addition of any sex chromosome or deletion of any sex chromosome from this karyotype 
that will result in this sex chromosome DSD. Uh, most common of them is mixed chromosomal dysgenesis, and most common karyotype which is associated with this entity is 46X or 46XY. Others are also there, which are not that much common. Overdiscular DSD karyotype, most common karyotype is for overdiscular DSD is 46XX. Coming to the 46XY DSD, again as we had talked, disorders of the gonadal development may lead to this, and uh, that we had talked already, and disorders of the endosome uh, endosom synthesis, that may be CH component or without CH also, defects of the endosome action, that is endosome insensitive syndrome, luteinizing hormone defects, or disorders of the anti-mullerian hormone and anti-mullerian hormone receptor, which will result in the persistent mullerian duct syndrome, not actually ambiguity. Coming to the 46X FDSD, it again it may be possible due to gonadal development, it will relate into the dysgenesis or excess testicular DSD or endosome excess due to any cause. Likely causes are CEH. That is, that is a CEH is the most common cause of DSD overall. And 21 hydroxylate deficiency makes 90% of CH patients, CH uh, uh, affected with uh, DSD people. So that is the most common cause overall. After that, fetoplacental aromatic deficiency or maternal luteoma that, that will cause virilization during only uh, pregnancy. It does not progress after birth. And overt genital ambiguity may occur due to structural defects, not due to hormonal causes or genes which decides growth development. So coming to some numbers to give us a perspective what we are dealing with, CH is the most common cause overall for DSD. Uh, for DSD, it is uh, like in females, it is more common than males because males with 21 hydroxylate deficiency do, does not have CSD, uh, uh, DSD. Worldwide incidence of 46XY DSD uh, in CH, this is around 1 is to 15,000. But in India, it is much more, much more common. Gonadal dysgenesis, like mixed gonadal dysgenesis and androgen insensitivity syndromes, they are the common causes. They come after CH. And CH and mixed gonadal dysgenesis constitute more than 50% of the all DSDs overall. Uh, coming to the numbers from India, these are the studies uh, I could found in recent uh, last uh, two decades from India, which have described uh, DSDs. So most common overall cause, CH in most studies, except one study which had shown 5 alpha deficiency. deficiency. Most common in uh, female excess uh, DSD, CH, no doubt regarding that. Most common cause for X5, as in, in global literature also, it differs from some percentage. But as a group, androgen insensitivity syndromes, 5 alpha adductase deficiency, and dysgenesis are the most common group, which give rise to X5 DSD. We will, uh, my following speaker will talk in detail about that. So, how do we go for evaluation of ambiguous genitalia? Aims of the evaluation first prevent short wasting crisis. That is the most important aim because that is the me medical emergency. After that, to provide a diagnosis and to address gender assignment because a DHD child may not be a medical emergency uh, in most of the cases, but it is a social emergency for, uh, for a family dealing with. And to provide guide for future management plan, that is. That may be surgery, that may be hormone replacement, that may be fertility prospects, and that may be risk of tumors. And how do we do that? By history, examination, hormonal, genetic, and radiological evaluation. To do that, we will require a multidisciplinary team. That will include a pediatric endocrinologist or endocrinologist who will, uh, who will be in the center of this team with urologist, psychologist, geneticist, radiologist, neonatologist, and a social worker. We'll make this multidisciplinary team. So coming to the uh, clues from history, if there is any history of concerning unity, then we should think of disorders which are inheritable, like CH is most common out of them and pyrophylactic deficiency is are other, other issues. Unexplained infant death, especially to rule out short wasting crisis, that uh, CH, I, uh, CH in previous children may be mis uh, misdiagnosed and children died without any treatment. Family history of infertility and gynecomastia that may come in a milder form of NADHDs. Family history of either amenorrheic uh, aunts or partially village uncles. That is very important because sometimes they say no, there is no one is affected. Then we we'll ask them, there is infertile females, unmarried females. They will tell yes, then we should ask and to examine them because they may be uh, XY underviled males also. 
Relation during pregnancy that will give clue for placental and rheumatoid deficiency. Early renal failure, gonad disease we should think of, and progesterone treatment. Prolonged progesterone treatment during pregnancy may give rise to antenatal relation. So coming to clinical examination, description of the genitalia. It is very important initially to document medical legally also and to plan our treatment in future also. So first thing to palpate gonads. Where are the gonads? Whether they are there? If they are there, where they are? So both sides of gonads should be palpated and documented. Then location of the urethral opening. Where it is? Uh, it is at the tip of the phallus or under surface of the phallus or whether they are single opening or two openings. Size of the phallus. It is, this will decide the future uh, surgery plans and it plays a role in the gender of rearing also. Degree of the labiosacral fusion and anogenital index. Anogenital index, what it is? It is a proportion of the ratio, proportion of the distance between NS and posterior forecheek and NS and uh, clitoris based on the phallus in males. So it is around 0.5 in the females and one in the males. As a girl child who is virilized goes from 0.5 towards one, it shows the extent of the virilization uh, happened during embryo phase. So it is a good indicator how much virilization occurred during fetal phase. So signs of adrenal insufficiency also during examination we should uh, see for hyperpigmentation. In children we see at genitalia, nipples, umbilicus and mucosa, poor weight gain, shock and hypoglycemia are other features which may child present in. Uh, these are the other clinical uh, parameters to look for virilization or undervirilization in a male or female child. Uh, external musculation score is used in the uh, apparently XY uh, children who are undervirilized. <coughs> it, it has four criteria. Total fusion and micropenis has either zero or three scores. Uthal, opening of the urethral matrix depending on the uh, what degree of hyperspadius is there has uh, zero, one, two and three scores. and Descent of the gonads will give score of 1.5 for each gonad will convert into the 12 total score of 12. So any child who is has score of less than 10 will be undervalidized. Similarly for X, uh, apparently XX females uh, to assess objective realization, we will see pradder staging. So earlier there will be only cryptomegaly, then there will be posterior fusion. In stage three, there will be positive fusion. So there will be only one opening, no two opening on the perineum and stage five will be like a male, normal male. So coming to approach now, when a newborn comes with the genital ambiguity, then first we'll palpal gonads. Ideally speaking, there should be fish available in the center who, who are dealing with the DST, but still in most of the centers in India, we do not have fish facility, which can give results in the hours whether there is Y component or not. So we will take a proxy of palpable gonads for that. If there are bilateral palpable gonads, then it is more or less we are dealing with the child who has XYDHD with palpable gonads or rarely when formal karyotypes comes, if it comes XX, then we will think that it, he may have XX testicular DHD also. If child does not have bilaterally palpable gonads, so we will see whether he has unilateral palpable gonads and unilateral non palpable gonads. Then it is possibly a chromosomal DHD because uh, mixed donor genesis uh, is the most frequent presentation like this. If it is not, there are no palpable gonads. Child may be either virilized XX DHD or undervirilized XY DHD, both conditions. Then our priority will be to rule out CAH first. So we'll do 17 hydroxyprestone, ACTH, cortisol, along with USG Mullerian structures, USG for Mullerian structures and uh, gonads, whether we can see on the ultrasound. And if 17 hydroxy progesterone is significantly raised, that cutoff is more than 10,000 nanograms per DL, then it is a classic CH we are dealing with. We will start management according to that. That is a medical emergency. And if it is modestly raised, it is raised but not up to that cutoff, then probably we are dealing with other less common type of CH. And we should ask for a BP because 11 beta hydroxylase and 7 alpha hydroxylase deficiency are other less common type of CH which may present right with ambiguity they have high VP. So that may give a clue. Then if there is normal 17 hydroxyprestone ACTH and cortisol, then it is very unlikely that we are dealing with CEH. So either it is a 46 XX DHD, virilized XX DHD or it is a 46 XY DHD without palpable gonads. 
So coming to first 46 acid BSD, uh, uh, like uh, practically speaking, when they are dealing with a child with 46 acid BSD, in most cases we are able to reach to a diagnosis because uh, around 90 percent of the children will have CH and uh, and others will have some entities which are very very defined generally. So they may have aromatase deficiency, P450 oxidative deficiency, maternal luteoma. Uh, that we will uh, uh, take from history and examination of the mother exogenous use of uh, metroxyprednisone acetate this is a common drug is being used for threatened abortions and child may have variation due to that it will it will not be progressive after child is born and anatomical defects like local exostrophy may present like bsd so these are the clues if there is history of maternal variation aromatase deficiency or luteoma suspected if there is history of progesterone injections then for threatened abortions we know that uh, it is possible due to uh, that a child will realize due to these injections if there are bony defects like cranial synostosis uh, long bone defects and synostosis of the radio ulnar uh, ulnar bones then it is antler bixler syndrome and it gives clue for p450 oxidative deficiency if there is low e2 high fsh and polycystic ovaries then probably we are dealing with aromatase deficiency coming to 46 hy dhd i will just rush through that then uh, there is detailed talk about this topic in next uh, session so this session uh, 46 x x y dhd with or without peripheral nodes conditions are either it is test uh, testosterone biosynthetic defects it may be cah that is 17 alpha hydroxyl deficiency c beta hydroxyl deficiency uh, p450 oxidative reductor deficiency p450 scc and star deficiency or non ceh conditions like 17 beta hydroxyl uh, uh, 3 deficiency and 5 alpha reductor deficiency or endogen action defect ais uh, spectrum lf receptor defect amh or amh receptor defect or gonadal dysgenesis so some clues to this diagnosis we will do hormonal workup that is lh fsh testo testo dihydrotestosterone and testo androgen dyne ratio that has to be done either in mini puberty that is around 2 uh, weeks to 3 or 4 months of life or during puberty or in between if you want to do then we should do hcg stimulated Uh, test it does not have any value after mini puberty without stimulation so we will have to do hcg stimulation test for that and along with that amh and usg pelvis for intern genitalia will give clue towards diagnosis so if it testosterone is normal or supra normal then two diagnosis will be there either it is high alpha reductase deficiency or a uh, endogen incentric inc- syndrome so for that we can do a testosterone dst ratio and sequencing for the gene of file product is uh, if it is low testosterone with normal amh then uh, and if there are more no molecular structures on the ultrasound then probably we are dealing with biosynthetic defect of the testosterone there is low low testosterone with high lh then probably we are dealing with the lh receptor defect low testosterone low amh and if there is molecular structures it is very likely that we are dealing with gonadal dysgenesis so uh, laparoscopy and biopsy of the gonads will give the diagnosis dysgenesis is the diagnosis of histopathological examination not a clinical diagnosis you can suspect from the scenario with the evaluation but it is a diagnosis of histopathology coming to the role of genetic tools for diagnosis uh, fish or quantitative fluorescent pcr should be available if not formal karyotype then if it is abnormal karyotype it is chromosomal dsd Like forty six XO, forty six XI mosaic. Yes, we logesh sir. Yes, sir. We have a maximum one minute left for the speech. Okay, actually, Next I don't. I am not able to see the clock here. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so it is chromosomal DSD. If it is not, if we we have normal cartilage of forty six XY or XX, then we should go for CGH CGH. Area. Specifically, if we have other defects, if it is also. if it shows something well and good if it does not then we should go for targeted gene or gene panel sequencing or exome sequencing depending on our facility so these are classical presentations of mixed gonadal dysgenesis it will be asymmetric gonads one side gonad is there one side is not and this is ceh highly pigmented child which is not growing with genital ambiguity this is a, C- a case of ceh late presentation of dsd these are also possible when child comes late either recognized late or when a female child has inguinal hernia 
or has delayed or incomplete progression of puberty realization in a female breast development in a male primary amenorrhea or occasionally cyclical hematuria gives a clue in a male that he may have bsd gender assignment is very important so factors which decides are degree of masculinization and size of ls uh, like surgical expertise risk of tumor and need of hormone replacement in the future will decide uh, whether which gender should be assigned so take home message from this will be embryonic genital age not uncommon in our, in our clinics medical emergency should be taken care of first social emergency will come next and held on like it is like we becomes a guardian for a patient when we have, we have once dealt, dealt with the patient uh, they will need lifelong care for their evaluation gender assignment surgery hormone replacement and management of the fertility and risk of tumors in future and medical aspects are very important in these cases should be taken care of very well thank you